Guys, uh, I'm sitting down with Jordan. He is a existing Polestar 2 owner. He's had his car for several months. He is a big fan of the electric platform, but his experience hasn't been perfect. And we're going to go through a couple of questions and answers with him where he's going to talk about real world experience owning a Polestar electric vehicle. So Jordan, thanks for stopping by. Yeah, thanks for having me. So tell us a little bit about your background. You know, have you always been interested in the EVs? Is this your first electric car? I wouldn't consider myself a um, EV zealot in, in any way. Uh, I'm uh, by nature a, a, a big technology person. So, you know, when, um, when Tesla first came onto the scene, the whole idea was really intriguing to me. Um, I think I could be concerned intrigued by them back to the GM EV1, like way back in the day. Um, you know, I thought it was really interesting. I was really happy to see that somebody was able to make a more um, accessible and, you know, all around more functional electric vehicle that was that was good for the masses. So that was really interesting to me with Tesla. Um, and the technology aspect really got me as well. Volvo came out with the, the Polestar brand, introduced that. I was following much more closely at that point. So, um, you know, that was... Uh, as, as somebody who's owned a lot of Volvos in the past, um, really attracted me to that. So I uh, decided, uh, you know, I am in a situation where uh, an EV makes sense for me. Uh, I primarily use it for my commute. Oh, this is your first electric vehicle then? Yeah, this is my first, this is my first EV. Yeah, uh, so I'm in Southern California. Uh, I live in Orange County. So uh, my, uh, my commute isn't... Uh, it isn't too extreme. I also, I should say, live somewhere where I don't have a garage. Um, so um, that that was a um, kind of a big, uh, you know, potential hang up for me with, with EVs. But it turns out that I'm able to charge um, at the uh, at my office park has has chargers and um, uh, I have a fast charger across the street from my house. So, uh, so that all works out for me. Um, and then I have family up in Northern California. We drive up a lot. So our, uh, our other car, a Volvo, um, is the, uh, the long distance family hauler. So you do take the internal ICE car for the, the road trips? Yeah, for, for, for right now, um, I, we haven't quit. We haven't quite hit the point yet where we are, um, where, where we feel like the infrastructure is there, the charging is fast enough. And uh, we have a two and a half year old uh, to, to, where we, to where we feel like we can really completely, uh, you know, cut out the ICE vehicle um, for, for those long trips. But I foresee in the near future that we'll be a um, all EV household. But do you tend to charge at home or not? I live in a, uh, in a townhome complex. So I, I have a carport that does not have power to it. And oh. uh, I don't really have an easy way to do uh, even 110 charging. No. For anybody watching that's not entirely clear, the Tesla supercharger network is separate. And, and while Elon has talked about sharing that or opening it right now, it's not available. And so um, as a regular EV owner, you got to share with the, the bolts and the, the Priuses and the, you know, the to any, any other full electric car, basically that shares this non Tesla charging uh, or a dollar twenty-five per hour for the first four hours. You get about through that four hours, I get about thirty percent charge on the car. So every few days, I'll I'll charge it there. Uh, but how do you find places to charge if you're out or even planning a trip? Charge point, which is probably the largest and what you'll find most places. Um, there's uh, like SEMA Connect. There's Electrify America. Um, there's a bunch of different ones. And there's an app and website called PlugShare um, that will kind of consolidate all of those and show you where they are based on location. And you can search based on the available charging speed and things like that. And as far as paying, um, in general, you're expected to have a account with, with each of them. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you have to load money into that account. Oh, um, be, be, because in general, you know, you might only be charging for, you know, what, when you go into, you know, do your grocery shopping or something like that. And that might only be, you know, half an hour. And that, uh, that cost is going to be so minimal, um, you know, you're, that 
the credit card transaction fees would be more than the cost of charging. So it doesn't make sense. So that's why in general, they ask you to load your, your card um, you know, with funds. So right now I would say it's a little clunky. Um, in general, I only use two. I use for fast charging. I use Electrify America um, in that fast charging system is really convenient. Gets you from, you know, 10 to 80% in about 40 minutes. Uh, it's a long um, extension cord. Hey. Yeah. Uh, extension cords uh, you're, you're, <laughs> can be a little bit of a gamble. You don't want to burn the house down. Uh, I think that's a great profile of how you use your car, um, you know, a little bit on your family size, your situation. But um, it's really interesting that you have it without a garage, you know, carport, but no power. So you're really forced to go outside to to charge. And, and luckily, you know, you have one at work, so that helps. But I'm sure during this, you know, pandemic and work from home, you were relying on other places too. So let's talk about the car a little bit. Um, how is the integration with Google Maps? So if you have that plug share, you know, can you can you search for things easily? Google Maps integration is fantastic. I got to say, it's probably one of my absolute favorite things about the car. Um, it works really, really well. Uh, it syncs up with your Google account. So if you were searching for something on your phone or on the computer, it, it sees what you were searching for. So it's already there. Um, it's really, really convenient. I, if I say I'm going from point A to point B and it says I'll have 56% remaining on my battery, it's got to be within like a percent or two. And it's, it's very, very accurate. There is another app called a better route planner that is better at it. And it integrates with the car that, that works well. Um, but I think people in general would still say that also is not a hundred percent there yet. Um, yeah. So in that car, you know, beyond the Google maps, they have the Google play. Um, do you, do you use that? Do you have Android, your iPhone? What? An all Apple person. <laughs> okay. Uh, store is there right now it's incredibly limited as far as what's on there i think google is still kind of hashing out um, how they want to deploy apps in that store right now it's it's tough because i don't have any easy way to get the things that i want onto the infotainment system besides doing bluetooth there's no carplay yet so if i have audiobooks there's no audible app on the uh, the car yet there's uh, there's no apple music app uh, things like audible are a nice to have in the first year or two of rollout and, and probably not a critical, you know, immediate need. So hopefully the good thing for, for Polestar is that these types of problems can be easily added in the next generation, retroactively updated. So, so now that you're in the car, you know, you've hooked up your phone, your, your Android phone or your iPhone, you've plugged in your destination. What's it like sitting in the driver's seat? It's good. It, it's uh, is somebody coming from a Volvo. It's very Volvo esque. Um, okay. The, the seats are the vegan um, leather. Um, I've seen them described as like a wetsuit material. Uh, I don't, I, I think that's off-putting and I don't yeah. find them that way, but they are very comfortable. Um, and uh, yeah, overall, I, I'm, I'm very happy with the- The, the cleanup interior. spills, like, it, you know, when, when I think of a neoprene or, or a wetsuit material, it's porous. So have you had wet spills? Does it feel like it disappears or is it- no, it's it's definitely not what I would consider porous at all. Um, at least not in the sense that like wetsuit is. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, I I think it's very uh, kid friendly. Uh, it, what like what's the first emotion that you think when you see or you look back at your car? Uh, I mean, I I love it. Uh, it's I I love the uniqueness of it. Um, it's it can be kind of polarizing for some people because it's, it's a unique ride height based on the, you know, size of the car. So it's a little bit raised, um, but it's a sedan, but they classify it as a lift back. Polestar has managed to carve out a design element that is still subtly Volvo, but very unique to Polestar. And I just, I just love it. Yeah, uh, no, I think that styling will have to be something that this car leads with, you know, uh, objectively on paper, um, sales numbers, dealer and network and charging support. It really bodes for the, the Tesla Model 3, maybe the performance or the long range, but the styling is something that you can't change. And the Tesla has, has received a lot of criticism for the, the droopy catfish face 
whereas the pole star you know really has a strong edge it's it's rectangular it's um you know a little bit taut lines and it's it's very attractive I, mean, I, th I think it looks great uh, to your point everybody has acknowledged the the volvo refresh you know the spa architecture as being a good design you know that that's really good and that language has translated but also been different for the pulsar because i think you look at the headlights and you say like oh that looks like a volvo it looks good but but the rest of the car is not a volvo it's it's a polestar in the overall design package so so really so beautiful car you still feel that way after and how many months how, how long have you had it uh, I uh, I got it in March uh, of, of this year, 2021. Okay, and so, so six months. I mean, yeah, so it's mm. it's six months and it hasn't gone either direct, uh, hasn't gone downhill in terms of the looks. No, no, not at all. In fact, the I've, I've actually only seen two other ones on the road. One was while driving and one was um, actually, <laughs> I don't know if I can count the second one. It was actually the uh, Polestar test drive guy oh. that was delivering a car for a test drive to somebody while he's charging at a station. And, um, but it's, it's kind of surreal. It's like you drive up and you're like, Oh, that's, that's another pole star. Like it looks really yeah. nice. <laughs> so for somebody, again, that, that wants something unique. And I think that that's very real for a lot of buyers is you don't want just another Tesla. I, I, I'm sure where you live, but where I live, I'm, I'm in Texas and Dallas, we have a ton of Teslas. And that's not to take anything away from Teslas and what they've done and, and you know, the great cars that they've done. But if, if you don't need that blistering tenth of a second and that cutting edge, you want something you more unique. And, you know, we've, we've seen that unique cars still sell. Look at how many, I don't know, Jaguar F-types or um, how Romeo or Maseratis still sell despite being an inferior car to everything else because of the styling and just by virtue of being unique. I don't want to lead with that, but I think that is part of the equation that this is a unique, it's a good looking car and somebody with six months, you don't see them on the road, even in Southern California is really saying something. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, awesome. So maybe we can switch a little bit. Let's talk about some of the negatives um, what has been, what has been some of the problems with your car? The biggest problems I have are, are always going to be software based. I would say with this car, well, knock on, knock on wood always, but, um, it, it seems to be for a car that primarily, I mean, is, is a computer. I mean, you know, as with computers, your issues are usually going to be software based. So, um, the week that I actually received the car, um, I had an issue with the driver assist features all like failing. So it wasn't the, um, let's see, lane keep assist, I believe wasn't working. The driver awareness system where it's supposed to tell you if you're falling asleep and mm -hmm. you know, jiggle you awake. Um, <clears throat> and the, uh, the radar cruise control, uh, none of them were working and it was, you know, a little concerning, uh, especially for somebody who bought essentially a Volvo for, you know, for, for, for safety purposes. Um, and so that was, that was a little jarring to have something like that happen. So immediately after I received the car and it required, and, and this kind of speaks to the dealership process, you can't just take it to your local Volvo dealership, or at least right. I couldn't back then. Um, and so it requires somebody from the, the space to pick up the car, take it back, work on it, and then drop it back off for you. My nearest space is in Los Angeles, um, which, oh. which for, it's actually deep Los Angeles. Um, so it's, it's, it's a solid like 50 miles through LA traffic. Uh, so, you know, it's like an hour and 45 minutes away and, and it's but nice. You didn't have are. to drive it. Did you have to drive it there? No, I didn't. And then just they, additional transit time. You're saying just added to the complexity and delay. Yeah. And, and I, you know, if at any point they decide they're not going to be able to take it up or they don't have drivers built or something like that, it would be a, you know, a, a long trip um, to their credit though. They brought, they dropped off a loaner when they picked up my car. And so it was all great. Um, but then, you know, they had it for about a week, um, which for somebody who just purchased a car that after, after two weeks, I had not had the car longer than I had the car. Um, and it required them to do some software updates in order to fix it. Overall, not a deal breaker. Uh, it's a brand new car with brand new software, things happen. Um, but, you know, and, and since then, that's kind of been a recurring theme. Um, little 
weird things that happen. Like uh, there's no audio in the car sometimes. Um, I'll like no audio, like the, the blinker clicking, there's no audio, just some random kind of quirky things that generally reset. If you leave the car for 10 minutes, come back and turn it back on and it, it's fine. So it's, you know, analogous probably to restarting your computer. Um, but you know, things like that, more, more quirks with the system that I'd say, you know, bona fide problems. Um, but enough to where, you know, if you're not expecting those things and you're you're not a little forgiving of them, they could probably get get pretty frustrating. It's a little bit disappointing if you're not used to it, but it can be forgiven if you're prepped for it. Touch screen, the infotainment system on the, the Polestar is like how you would describe the Tesla. I mean, it is buttery yeah. smooth. It's very fast, very responsive. Um, I, I, I think, so with the census, I would say it's a combination of uh, old old hardware uh, coupled with a proprietary system. Um, you know, when, when you think about these cars, they've been in development and planning for so long that they're sourcing computer components for them that by the time the car is actually released to the public, you know, those computer systems are, are years and years old. So I think even the Polestar has, you know, like a four or five year old um, system in it, like a, a, you know, Android chip in it going on. Some people just, didn't want a Tesla, so they got the the Polestar. Um, no, I, I do get it's it's still at that point where I get a ton of people asking me about it. Do you ever <laughs> drag race anybody on the street? I mean, no, <laughs> uh, no. I get a lot of people asking me about it, um, but I but I, I I haven't. I think people don't know what it is, so they, yeah. <laughs> I think they're they're probably reticent to. Uh, to, to drag race somebody if they don't know if it's, you know, as slow as a, you know, a Corolla or something, or, <laughs> or if it's yeah. fast as a Tesla. Well, so. well, one thing I like too, and I, um, I think I saw it on a thread or uh, maybe a video was how they don't have, you know, text for the logo, you know, the pole star is just the star and it's really, it's kind of like a neat thing where they're not going for blatant, um, uh, branding and they're trying to just kind of evoke this i don't know about curiosity but like oh you know what is that yeah, that symbol is pulsar it's a true logo not just amalgamation of your letters you know initials into a logo it's um it's pulsar i mean so yeah no absolutely uh i mean i i, I don't mind people asking me about the car um uh, i had a tow truck driver while i was driving uh, roll down his window and point and you know I'm used to it he's he says is that a Volvo and I was like I was like no but it's a Volvo subsidiary and he's like oh he's like, I recognize that I, I like I tow Volvos every day <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely one of the people that doesn't want to blend into the crowd with the car. You know, I don't want a yellow Lamborghini, but but I also don't want the same car as everybody else, which was I'm cool. Like I, I have a good looking unique car that's all right guys well that wraps up jordan's long-term impressions with his polestar 2. uh you know he's had it for over nine months and really the issues have been confined to software issues which have been updated and resolved by his polestar space but i'm going to continually update uh based on his ownership and as well as i got another car in new york that i've been talking to so smash that like button uh, leave a comment if you guys have a question about the polestar 2 and subscribe for more volvo and polestar content we'll see you next time